everybody. Uh, I have a special, very special guest this evening. I have Eric Fink. And Eric is a law professor at Elon University. And he is seeking to run for the 26th district here in all of Rockingham County, part of Greensboro, and part of northern Guilford County. So it's, an, it's a quirky little district, so you need to find out where you, you fall. But we want to talk about the fact that why did you decide to do this and not filed in de file in December, but going at it from a petition standpoint? Yeah, well, I ended up um, deciding to run uh, as an unaffiliated candidate um, in late March after I discovered that there wasn't any other candidate running um, against the incumbent Senator Berger. Right. Um, and, you know, so that's, that was the point at which I made the decision. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and no one, even if they're an awesome yeah. uh, senator, should ever run unopposed. Yeah, that was one of, the, uh, one of the reasons. You know, we have quite a few people, quite a few incumbents in the General Assembly running unopposed. And just, you know, even if you love the person, uh, there's, there's something troubling about having unopposed races in a, in a democratic society. Right. You know? well, let's talk about the petition process, yeah. because that's how you are going to have to get your name yeah. on the ballot for this fall. Yeah. And you need at least like 5,100 signatures. Yeah, it's about 5,100, 5,200. Yeah. It's for, North Carolina has one of the toughest um, requirements for unaffiliated candidates to get on the ballot, one of the toughest in the country. For races like this, it's 4% of the registered voters in the district. Um, so in this district, that works out to somewhere around 5,100, 5,200 people. So you actually need yeah. about 10,000 signatures to be sure you've got 50, yeah, say yeah. 5,200 that qualify. Yeah, one of the things that happens is people, especially because the districts don't coincide neatly with a county, um, people aren't always aware of what district they're in, and it, even more when the districts have been redrawn fairly recently still. Mm -hmm. So people will sometimes sign mistakenly thinking they're in the district. Sometimes people sign not realizing they're not registered to vote. Right. Um, so have to have some allowance for some signatures that may, you know, turn out not to be, um, you know, not to qualify. Why do you think it is so tough for someone here yeah. in the state of North Carolina to get on the ballot? Do you think it has yeah. something to do with the two-party system yeah. or what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, in general in this country compared to a lot of other countries, say in Western Europe, um, the ballot access is much more restrictive because of the history of the two-party system um, so that people in the two established parties get on through the primary process but uh, make it hard for other groups um, to get on. In, in, you know, in some countries all you have to do is pay um, the equivalent of a couple hundred bucks and anyone can be on the ballot. And sure. you know, I suppose that creates a problem. You can end sure. up with a hundred people and it's sure. kind of confusing. <laughs> um, here in a lot of places in this country kind of have the other extreme makes it exceedingly difficult um, and you know there's been some interest in recent years as you have more people who are independent voters unaffiliated mm -hmm. voters um, people looking to have new parties here in North Carolina we do have a third recognized party the libertarians sure. mm -hmm. um, were the first new party to gain um, recognition uh, that was an incredibly difficult process there are others like the Greens who um, have been trying to um, that's they need obviously a lot more than 5,000 names um, so for an individual candidate you know, it's pretty tricky. It is um, tricky. And in fact, up until this, up until now, no one in North Carolina has successfully gotten on the ballot this way for a state Senate or state House race. Um, this year, there are a few other people besides myself um, going through the process for both houses in the General Assembly. And, you know, I'm optimistic that I'm going to make it. I'm sure, you know, at least some of them are optimistic um, that they're going to make it. So we might see at least that kind of history made this year. That would be pretty interesting, I yeah. think, um, just to see it happen. Yeah. Like we had our first black president. We're looking like we may or may yeah. not yeah. have our first woman president. Yeah. You know, so it's, yeah. it's, 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 uh, groundbreaking. Yeah, well, and I think having these unopposed candidates um, from one party or the other, that opens up some space because people, again, who may want at least to have a choice, um, there's not an existing choice. It's been a lot easier for me, I think, to get signatures than if there were two party um, candidates already sure. on the ballot. People would quite reasonably be less interested. 
Um, but they're very yeah. interested because he's yeah. running unopposed this time. Yeah, and I've been, I've been out and about trying to collect a lot of these signatures myself. I've got, obviously, lots of friends and supporters trying to do it. Uh, I've encountered lots and lots of people who've told me they have voted for Senator Berger in the past, they're inclined to vote for him now, but that they would sign my petition just on democratic principles. And I'm very grateful to those people. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate um, their honesty and their giving me that opportunity. Well, you know, I think a lot of people realize that <coughs> choice is what our country is built on. Yeah. And if you don't have choice, how can you have a democratic society. Exactly. I mean, you know, we look to, you know, societies that are clearly not democratic, mm -hmm. that have elections, but with just one person on the ballot, right. we don't take that seriously. <laughs> now, you know, even, you know, even having unopposed candidates in North Carolina, obviously it's not a fair analogy because right. we still have competition, but it's, it gets people out of the habit, I think. Democracy in some sense has to be a habit. And it's like any other habit, just like exercise. If you stop practicing it, um, you can get a little flabby. You know. <laughs> yes, yes, you can. Yeah. Well, how do people get a ballot? Let's talk about that real quick. So how can they get a ballot? Uh, the, the petition to but, sign. Uh, yes, yeah. I'm sorry, the petition. Yeah, well, as I say, I've been going around. We've had some people going around various ways. At, you know, some, I've been here in Reedsville and up in Eden and in Madison at some of the street fairs. We've had some people going around um, in neighborhoods. Um, but another way is I have a campaign website, and we've got a copy up there. So a lot of people have downloaded it, and it's got you know, instructions on there how you can um, mail it back to us, or you can call the campaign, and we'll mm -hmm. come and pick it up. Sure. Um, and uh, people can even um, contact the campaign through the website, and you know we'll bring ballot um, petition forms to anybody who's um, willing to sign them. That's pretty yeah. good. All right, let's talk about some issues that you are sure. are have a penchant for here. Yeah. Um, I know that you want to talk about the Coal Ash Management Act. Yeah. That I think a lot of people would like to hear your thoughts on that because yeah. um, it was kind of amended in a last minute decision yeah. and then voted on. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's an issue that was already um, very high on my radar screen and now, you know, the events of the last few days mm -hmm. have, have brought renewed attention. Um, I, among many other reasons that I care about this, I'm a fisherman. Um, yes. And I actually like to fish. Um, one of the closest places, I live in Greensboro, one of the closest places that I like to go is just um, on the other side of the county here in the Mayo River. Yes. Um, and sometimes up further up the Dan River, um, further west of here where they have trout fishing in the Dan River. So, you know, I care at that personal level a lot about clean water. Mm -hmm. um, for people here in Rockingham County, obviously the Dan River is yes. one of the most you know, notable natural features mm -hmm. and an important source of water. Um, for, for, a very important you know, source of water. For people. <laughs> so that coal ash spill, I think, really, you know, got a lot of people concerned. Um, it was really a great thing that the state enacted the Management Act um, two years ago. Um, Although a lot of us, you know, who are concerned about uh, resources didn't necessarily think it went far enough and that, it, you know, the timetable might be too long um, and it left unresolved this question of who's ultimately going to bear the cost. Right. It was a good step in the right direction. Uh, there was this issue about having a commission versus um, the Department of Environmental Quality. Um, the court weighed in on it. Now the legislature has come back and are trying to revive this um, commission um, idea. A lot of people, myself included, see this as too much of a concession to um, Duke Energy, to be mm -hmm. quite honest. Mm -hmm. um, the commission is too subject, I think, to influence by, you know, a very powerful and deep-pocketed uh, corporation that has a strong interest in protecting its shareholders. And, you know, that's not because they're bad people. That's their legal obligation to protect their shareholders. But the legislator's ob obligation is to protect the people of this state. And making sure that regulation is in the hands of impartial people who are going to, you know, require the best practices for the most effective and speediest cleanup and to ensure that going forward we don't face problems like this again. That's what we need. So, you know, like a lot of other people, I see this latest amendment as a step in the wrong direction. Well, what about the uh, who is bearing the cost? Yeah. Um, the end user or Duke itself. Yeah. And it's looking like it's to be the end user. How do you feel about that? Yeah, this is, uh, you know, two years ago when they passed the act, uh, you know, for 
again, I can understand the politics behind this, that that was not included in the act. Right. Um, I, you know, and I, I understand it's hard to get people together to pass something, but that's a, that's a crucial question. Uh, as it stands now, what is likely to happen is that Duke is going to try to pass that cost on to its customers through rate increases. Now, those are supposed to be approved by the state regulators, but the history, and it's not this state in particular, in, in every state, power companies tend to get the rate increases that they ask for. Sure. Um, they have a lot of influence, and that's just the way uh, things work. Uh, in a case like this, uh, this was something that resulted from Duke Power's own business decisions, um, decisions that, you know, again, a lot of people, including myself, view as negligent. Mm -hmm. um, this caused a big problem. I, I think to put it a little bluntly, it's Duke's mess. They should clean it up, and they should pay for it. You know, Duke is a corporation. It's owned by shareholders. The way that system is supposed to work is that shareholders invest their money and they are taking a risk. They earn returns on their investment because they're being compensated for the risks that they take in investing. The problem that we have, and this is just one example of a very common problem, is we, you know, you can look at the bank bailout, you know, sure. um, as another example and you can see it over and over again. We have too often a system where we privatize the rewards, the corporation, the shareholders reap all the rewards, they get to decide um, how to allocate the profits and they allocate them to themselves, but they want to socialize the risks. When things go bad, when they experience a big loss, they turn to either the taxpayers or the consumers to bail them out. And that's neither economically efficient nor socially just. I agree. <laughs> okay, what about Miller Coors with their uh, closing and loss yeah. of jobs? I know yeah. you, you have some feelings on that. Yeah, incredibly troubling. I have, I have, first of all, tremendous feelings of, of compassion for everybody in this county and in Eden, and specifically for the more than 400 workers who are going to lose their jobs. And this is not just the loss of 400 jobs. These are 400 jobs that paid really well. Yes. Um, these folks are represented by the Teamsters. They had good wages, good benefits. Um, and it was a great plant. You know, I, I've never been in there, but I understand it's real modern and, mm -hmm. you know, successful. The issue is not that it's not economically um, productive, but because of their merger, they have an excess now of capacity and they want to consolidate it. Um, at one level, this is the result of corporate happenings, corporate goings on that are far, far removed from Eden and Rockingham County. Mm -hmm. um, this is a merger between two companies that are part of giant global corporations located outside the United States that, again, they're making legal and, and you know, from their perspective, valid business decisions in the interest of their shareholders, but those interests are now colliding with the interests of people here. I, th I think the problem, it's, I'm not really interested in pointing fingers um, because I don't think what happened was the result of policies that were taken or not taken in North Carolina. What I do think is that we've had a, a, a very limited approach to economic development that's focused on attracting out-of-state business. Not necessarily a bad thing to do, but we do it through often tax incentives and, and other kinds of giveaways. Mm -hmm. um, that was not specifically the case with Miller Coors, but it's likely to be um, the sort of thing that's going to be tried to replace them. That kind of approach, it, it proves Dell is a good example. It's not a sustainable way to get jobs that are really going to stay here. And it's not a way to get jobs that are really going to pay people the kind of wages that these workers at, at Miller Coors um, you know, are, were earning. So one of the things I'm interested in is exploring some new, more creative ways of promoting locally based and grounded businesses, businesses that have real ties to the communities that aren't just looking to move from place to place to place in search of the cheapest workers and the cheapest taxes, but that want to be in a place where they will produce goods, provide services that people want, um, that people will buy and pay for, employ people with good wages, and stay there and help build the community. That's what Rockingham County needs. That's what North Carolina needs. In other words, people that are companies that are vested exactly. in our communities and become community exactly. partners. Exactly. All right, let's talk about education funding because, you know, that's near and dear to my heart. Yeah. And I know it is to you. Yeah. 
Yeah, again, I, you know, I'm an educator for a living. Right. I teach in law school. In the past, I've taught um, college students. I have a five-year-old son who, um, in just a couple of weeks, will be graduating from public school, um, elementary school in Guilford County, and in the fall, uh, moving on to middle school, which gives me, as a parent, great trepidation. Wait but a minute, he, is he five years old or a fifth grader? Fifth grader, there yes, go, pardon, okay. pardon me. He's 11, <laughs> Let's just square. He'll, he'll kill me. No, he's 11 years old and, and in fifth grade. Um, yes, on, on his way to middle school. Um, so from both perspectives, I, uh, you know, education is, is tremendously important to me. Uh, when we moved, my family and I moved to North Carolina nine years ago for me to take my job in, uh, in Greensboro at Elon, one of the things that excited us was knowing that this state had really solid public schools and world-class, amazing public universities. Mm -hmm. uh, we knew we were coming to a place that valued education, that put their money where their mouth was, and that was really succeeding um, educationally. And it was paying off. It's why North Carolina has been one of the fastest growing states. It's why North Carolina has been an economically successful state. In the past few years, we've seen a complete 180. I've seen in my son's school uh, you know, the effects at the ground level of decreased funding. Teachers who had been there, experienced, outstanding teachers, are leaving for greener pastures. They're having trouble replacing them with new teachers because the pay is better elsewhere. The list that we get at the beginning of the year of the supplies we need to provide mm -hmm. gets longer and longer and the check I write or the you know the charge on my visa card every fall gets bigger and bigger um, when I have to bring those bags of supplies you know uh, to school this is this is a kind of a hidden tax. And wait a minute, know? for you, that's not a problem, that's correct? That's right. I make a good living. Right, um, but and there are I, some parents yeah. that can't. My son's school is actually located in the Warnersville neighborhood, which is a very low-income neighborhood, and it's a magnet school, so they have the you know, good fortune of having a mix of parents. You know, my wife and I and some of the other folks we know, you know, we know we have the means. We try to bring double right. because there are kids in that school whose families just do not have the means um, to go spend that kind of money at Walmart or Target. Uh, but this is really another kind of hidden tax. Um, you know, the notion that we're going to cut taxes and cut funding, it's, it's really an illusion because I, you know, personally, I don't really care how much I pay in taxes. Tax is just a label. What I care about is what are the things I need and want? What are the facilities and resources that I want? One of those is great schools. Mm -hmm. Those cost money. I want to know how much does it cost? What's my fair share of paying for it? And I am happy to pay it. And quite honestly, I'd rather pay it in one payment in my taxes than in a whole lot of nickel and dime payments or not such nickel and dime right. payments um, that are less efficient and probably add up to more money. Um, so I think this is a terrible, terrible problem. All right, before we run out of time, we've got one more subject that you would really like to cover, yeah. and that's HB2 yeah. and government overreach. Yeah, HB2, you know, it's gotten a lot of attention. Yeah, it's been called the bathroom bill, but yeah. we know it's more than that. There's there's two fundamental problems with HB2. The first is that it's deceptive and I think very cynical. This bill was adopted with the headline of so-called bathroom safety. People have called it a solution in, in, to a problem nobody had or an answer to a question no one was asking. There are no recorded incidents of anybody in North Carolina or anywhere else um, having trouble in a public restroom merely because a person who is gender non-conforming is using the bathroom that they feel comfortable using. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I understand that people individually have personal feelings about this. Where you go to do your business is, <laughs> is intensely personal. It sure it is. But it should be personal. It shouldn't be the business of the state legislature. The, the really troubling thing is that provision was used there as, as a distractor, as a smoke screen. It's used to rile people up. Um, it's, it's, it, it's used to, you know, to stir up um, you know, anger or animosity towards a group of people who you know, might be unfamiliar to, to some people. Um, and it's used as a cover for the big provisions in that yes. bill, which take away power from cities and counties and undermine protections for 
working people on the job. So in this case, taking away the power of local government to make local decisions for local wages, the uh, wages that they pay to contractors who they hire to pay out of their local tax funds, um, and taking away the ability of people who have been wrongfully discriminated against, taking away their ability to sue in state court. You know, I'm a law professor. If the state is going to take the trouble to have a law that says discrimination on some basis is illegal, there's no point in having that law if the state doesn't also say, if that law is broken, here's how you remedy it. That turns the law into a farce. Um, and, you know, again, as a law professor, this bothers me. And I think as citizens, this should bother me. This is, this is game playing on the, taxpayers, on the taxpayers' time and on the taxpayers' dime. All right, you've got about one minute. I want you to look in the camera and tell people why they should get a petition and sign it. Well, um, I think you should get a petition first because if you believe in the democratic process, people do deserve to have a choice in the election. Um, and second, at least if you agree with my, the concerns I've raised and the perspectives I've shared on these crucial issues, um, I hope you'll see that I am a good candidate to represent the interests of this district in Raleigh. And what is your... Um Web page. Yeah, the website is think2016.org, um, and on there you can find some information about me. You can download these petitions. Um, you can get in touch with the campaign if you want to volunteer to help us out or if you have any questions. Thank you, Eric. Thank Folks, you. I hope we have informed you tonight of some very valid points uh, coming up with the upcoming election this fall. If you feel so inclined, please go to Eric's website, get your petition, sign it. And until we see you again next time, I'm Debbie Moore, and thank you. I'm Debbie Moore, reporting for Star News.